So welcome everyone. We are going to start uh, our uh, debate. Thank you for coming uh, despite the weather. Um, Debra, can you stand a little bit closer to our uh, sort of artistic marriage that <laughs> we present? Uh, this, this art research uh, uh, is a lot about us. In, in the last uh, year, we try to merge uh, our um, sensitivity and our uh, views into something concrete as this exhibition. So at this uh, last day of the exhibition, I think it's... Uh, it's, uh, it's very special to be here to celebrate uh, ourselves with a little kadoche with uh, a Sarapaneva ring that we are uh, wearing. It's a little bit too big to wear it all the time. But and, um, and actually, I think it's also a good wish of a San Valentine for everyone in the room and for our guests that came so far in the panel. Today, we have uh, a star, I would say, Stacy Herbert, who um, reached us from Spain. I think you fly from London, actually, from London. <laughs> and uh, and she's, she's co-hosted together with Max uh, Kaiser of the Financial War Reports on uh, Russia TV, something that uh, would be really missed if it wouldn't be there, because if I know what I mean, no one is speaking about the financial markets as they are, with their wittiness, with their irony, but also with their sharpness into saying things that people don't dare to say. So please join our panel, and please also you, Debra. And uh, let me also call uh, to the stage uh, Josephine Bosma, an art critic, author of uh, Netitude. Let's talk about net art. In fact, the first person I ever heard about talking of net art, uh, a sort of uh, uh, ensemble, uh, artistic uh, ensemble that, uh, that I was also put uh, together in. She knows better than me how and why. And uh, I really uh, like her critical view on uh, most things. Probably she has uh, something to say about this exhibition that we have not predicted or feel free to criticize it as well. So please join us. Uh, and Ron Pepperkamp from the Kunstbank Reserve. I met Ron uh, a year ago in, into a debate in which um, he was presenting his project. I was absolutely impressed. Ron managed to buy an a old minting machine from uh, the, the old times of the foreign here. And he still activates it and creates uh, these not so symbolical, one would say, artworks that are actually coined into coins. So operating this thing, he has, uh, uh, um, uh, he has basically uh, developed a whole narrative about art and minting objects of value and actually attributing value to art back and forth. So he will tell us more about it. And last but not least, Kurt van Mensfort, very well known uh, also here in the Netherlands and around from the Next Nature project. He is absolutely uh, a visionary in design and I hope he will give us um, a vision about his project EcoCoin that has also a lot to do with our uh, panel, please. So I might sit right in the middle here. Thank you. And I will start. I will start and try to moderate this panel, or better, provoke it, because I think <laughs> you are all very good in being <laughs> moderately uh, uh, diplomatic. <laughs> uh, uh, I will try to provoke it uh, a little bit by first and foremost uh, setting um, in front, uh, setting forward this this concern that we had with this artwork, and especially with the Real Botanique, the installation that you can see here behind. What, uh, what is the value creation? What is the value attribution in the age of financial markets, in the age in which exchange value, to put it in Marxian terms, uh, is basically establishing the value of objects and of immaterial assets that we, that we, um, that we put on the market, that we sell and buy? 
how this works in relation of the creation of value of art. What is exactly that attributes value in terms of uh, really monetary value uh, when we talk about food production today, when we talk about soil generation, and when we talk about immaterial assets, be them the most advanced immaterial assets, for instance, Bitcoin. We are living through a very strange time in which the most abstract value creation is actually worthed a lot on the financial market and actually the capacity of producing unique digital assets uh, as the Bitcoin phenomenon shown, as shown is, is really the, the, the core of it in the moment in which we can produce something that cannot be duplicated but it's still digital then we created uh, an enormous phenomenon that will uh, change actually the world of markets as we know it. And how can we relate this extremely abstract process to the very important process to us, our bodies and also our minds of regenerating and generating the nature that we need to support ourselves. So to, uh, to quote uh, uh, your organization, what is the next nature that we are looking at? What is, uh, uh, what is the dynamic that can reconcile actually these value creations? And I would like you to, il uh, to illustrate us your ideas through your projects also with a simple uh, round now uh, from the point of view of art and value creation in art, but also from the point of view of value creation in natural processes and also in financial markets. So in pure demand and um, and, and basically uh, how our desires work, eh? because the market is a little bit also a picture of collective desires, as ephemeral as they can be. So who like to start? Now, well, Jan Neil and I made this exhibition, in fact, and uh, two of the works we made together because of this discrepancy that we feel really strongly. And um, one of the things that I do as uh, founder of the Mania Fuga, that's the name of my foundation, we produce uh, edible landscapes in the public space. And in the Netherlands, that means producing soil along with it, or it would have meant bringing soil in, but that's ridiculous. Instead, we thought, now this material, we're going to produce a valuable soil, one that has nutrition, and one that can sustain food that would become nutritious itself. You can't grow nutritious food on unnutritious soil. And uh, we managed to do this uh, really well, in fact, with all of the volunteers. Uh, we have the, the location manager here, and um, we just recently got our soil study back that we initiated with uh, uh, Ron here. And they were astounded. It took me more than two years to even get them to the garden because they could not believe that it was possible by hand to even do this. Just a bunch of people over uh, the middle age. <laughs> but. Um, so I tried, it was anyway, because the uh, result of the study was that the soils were fantastic, ex extraordinary. They said it's a, an ecological paradise in the soil that you created, especially compared to the soil that you started with. And I said, well, let's talk about that value creation and how, how can we use that? And the soil scientist, very nice guy, Paul Rinkin, is a very a wonderful man. And interesting and in figuring in these uh, discussions a lot and I said what about the ecosystem services and he said well the ecosystem services of your fantastic soil they're mentioned they're um, they have to do when, if you wanted to uh, translate it into financial terms they would have to um, yeah they're not about prevention prevention of poverty or prevention of lack of nutrition or even necessarily prevention of flooding, which is one thing that the soil in our garden can do, because it can absorb so much more water than all the other soil around. 
but it's uh, the, the, that's ecosystem services at this time are not uh, constructed in that way to talk about preventing damage. And, uh, they're about something that you can literally just sell or uh, real estate value. That's a problem. That's uh, anyway that motivates me to get involved with policy as an artwork. Maybe I've spoken too long. That's, uh, anyway, that's my frame. Well, I'll pick up from there because um, uh, first of all, I work with uh, I work for the financial markets, and one of the things you see going on, especially since 2000, is this common entity. Uh, I, uh, uh, in fact, energy is not flowing in. Energy is decaying in the financial markets, which is why you see the inflationary collapse. And 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 part of that. Is I think we highlight it, connect it to some of Deborah's work because I went to her studio, and first she took me to the left, and we went through the the various beautiful blooms, and uh, you know flowers and pears and strawberries and raspberries, and we were eating all sorts of flowers and and leaves, and she's like, oh, don't eat that one, you might die, and I was like, oh, that was close, but at the end of it, then she took me to the soil creation and opened up this lid of the most horrifying <laughs> thing to any normal person, these uh, dead f f fruit and, and plants and, and worms crawling all over the place. And what we have in the financial markets right now is essentially uh, the these giant corporations, this lack of diversity in this in the financial sphere, especially, but they're not allowed to die. They're not allowed to rot. They're not allowed to die and provide the nourishment for the next uh, concept to grow up. And I think uh, Bitcoin is is something that is thriving in the weeds. It, it emerged out of the weeds of our fin our decaying financial system, and if if capitalism reflects, um, you know, nature, as Adam Smith said, you know, basically we have a gameskeeper, the, the central banks and treasuries around the world, and they've decided, oh, they just can't stand seeing that the, these lions kill those antelope. That's so horrible. We must, you know, we must stop it. We can't allow this to happen. It's too horrifying to see. So they're choosing winners and losers on this horrifying, you know, Serengeti, you might be out there and you want to choose, like, that one's so pretty and I don't want them to be eaten. And But they've chosen a certain group of winners and w the unintended consequences are all of the decay and uh, financial chaos we see around us. So it's an amazing, uh, I think it's an amazing picture. Yeah. So already a relationship, the financial market needs mulching, needs composting. Yeah, needs How do we compost the too big to fail? Because, <laughs> because you know, new ideas come out of the failed ones and m new guys come along and, and might pick up on wi why they didn't quite get it right and we can flourish in a new company. Ron, uh, you like to, to pick up from here? Well, uh, I, can, I can completely agree with that. I mean, it's... Uh, Well, I'm I'm all in favor of, uh, of of creative destruction, and and uh, that's what you're talking about, basically. Um, well, I, I, I can explain a little bit about the project that um, I've initiated uh, some eight years ago already. Um, I've set up a bank, um, and this bank is actually an experiment to test the viability of a new kind, a new currency. A currency which is not based on the um, uh, the value of um, uh, the, um, the, the the value that we can create in the future, so the value of uh, debt. That's basically what our money is based on today. It's on based on the promise of endless economic growth. Um, but we want to introduce a completely new idea, and that's the value of art. Um, now, this is a nice idea, but um, how are you going to test this? How are you going to test whether this new currency is viable? 
So we've set up a very simple experiment that you can buy a coin, which is uh, designed by um, some well, pretty well-known Dutch artists. Uh, I have a sample here. It's this size. Uh, quite big, yeah. This is a, a, a coin designed by um, Eric van Lieshout, which is, um, well, one of the best-selling Dutch <laughs> artists at the moment. And uh, we mint these, these coins in a limited edition of just 100 copies. So it is a quite rare piece of art. Um, and, well, the question is, what, what's, what's the economic value of this? Uh, so we set up the experiment that you can buy this coin for um, a very low price, just 100 euros. Um, and, well, you think, yeah, I have a nice piece of art, uh, but it's also currency, i.e., you can change it for ordinary money again. So you can go back to the bank and say, I don't trust the value of art, I want normal money. I want euros, dollars, yens. Um, then you get the exact amount that you paid for it, you get back, uh, plus 10% interest. So the incentive to return <coughs> this coin is incredibly high, because no bank in the world uh, is giving you 10% interest. But the incentive to keep the coin is also quite high because you think, well, okay, <laughs> this is a piece of art. Um, this, th this could be worth something uh, in either now or in the future. So you start to weigh the value of art, of this coin, against the value of ordinary money. And that is, I think, the only way that you, that you can really test something. You, you should really put things on, on, on a balance. Uh, that's how the markets work. That's how, in this case, our project works. So the question is, how long can this bank exist? Because um, yeah, if too many people return the coin, then obviously we, we cannot uh, uh, produce 10% interest out of thin air like the central banks. So uh, <laughs> then we go bust. Which is again a, f a form of, of how our economy <coughs> works. That that's that's the deal. <coughs> if you fail, you you go bust. Um, so that's basically the project, and it, it's so the, the the concept is that we want to introduce the um, the the idea of art as the base of a money system. Um, I can elaborate on that, but that would take too long. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. I think it's, uh, it's a really a good spark, also because uh, you highlight something that is already used in the market, because artworks are used by these big, fat bankers. If you go out in one of the big banks, and they treat artists as commodities themselves. And in your example, you are an artist reappropriating that financial space of producing art. My question to you is whether it's still convenient because to activate the machinery that you have to coin, it's very expensive because it takes a lot of electricity, I understand. And, uh, but we can elaborate about that later, about the margin. Eh? In, in the meantime, yeah, Kurt, you like to? Okay. Well, good idea so far. And first of all, I endorse this project inside. I love it. Um, money has become too virtual. That's an issue. And uh, we think this is a recent phenomenon with the Bitcoin that has already been mentioned. But actually, when you look at the history of money, you understand that, uh, well, it has been virtual almost forever. Well, not in the beginning, where we were still trading cattle for cows for chickens uh, or for tools. Uh, and I studied this a bit. And then uh, you realize that at a certain moment, a rich person would have 100 tools on his or her land and that would be value, but these tools would not be used anymore for digging, but only for trading. And then blacksmiths, they said like, why not make them small? So I have here this uh, virtual money 600 BC. This is the Chinese spade coin. And uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's not practical anymore to use it for digging. 
but you're only using it for trading. And, and, and uh, already 600 BC, money was becoming virtual. Do we get that? It became later, it became smaller, like this. And then at a certain moment, someone said, okay, we could also make them round. And that's how the coin emerged. Yeah, with this hole in it, and later we didn't need the hole anymore. Uh, and then we got paper money, credit cards. So you see this tenden tendency towards the intangible in our monetary system for ages. And uh, the problem that we address today now is that there's this mismatch between the financial system and what is actually valuable in life. Well, what's the most valuable for people in life? I guess water, uh, but also all these services that are part of the biosphere um, or just things in the biosphere. I think it's, I find it quite ridiculous that you can earn money by cutting a tree, but you cannot earn money by planting a tree. And this just shows the mismatch between the biosphere and the financial sphere, or I often call it the technosphere. Um, the biosphere is, is uh, threatened, it's, uh, and, the, and the technosphere, it's threatening, it's growing. The, uh, this is also the next nature, I, I see this as the next nature. And I think it's time we connect the two again. Uh, my attempt to, to do this, and I haven't nailed it, I must add, uh, because it's, uh, I think it's the diff most difficult project that I have ever started in my life and I need some years, I need some time and some help. But th the idea to address this is to uh, create a new coin, uh, which would be the ECHO coin, a currency for environmental value. And then people who do good for the environment should be able to earn ECHOs. So you could earn some ECHO coins by planting a tree. Of course, we need lots of technology to measure this and address it. And we can look at the Bitcoin system, maybe tweak it. We can combine it with Wikipedia. Well, now I'm getting technical, and that's maybe for later, for people who are interesting, interested. But I, my question to you is, who would be the ones, who, what people would er earn an Echo coin today? I think Deborah is among them with, uh, with, uh, with your projects. Maybe you too. Well, you can follow up and tell us if you are also. I, I don't deserve an echo coin for sure. But um, <laughs> um, I'm going to switch a tiny bit uh, the topic of conversation because I was asked to talk about art, the art context specifically, and the relationship of this work to the art context. And yesterday, talking about value, and uh, I thought your talk, was actually interesting because you talk about the immaterial, the virtual uh, aspect of money. And I think the problem uh, th that the virtual aspect of money is, is a completely logical, uh, how do you say this, um, consequence of what it, what it represents, of what it, what it is used for, namely uh, to, to, to sort of um, return the value of something that is given to you. And this value is not always clear cut. It's not always obvious, you know, there's things piling up in value that is not uh, visible to the naked eye, let's say. Huh? So, uh, and the problem is that this is in art, this is, you know, this, uh, this is a common issue. Yesterday I uh, had a very, very depressing experience. I was at a, at a presentation of an American art critic who talked about art online. And, um, well, she started with a very amusing, uh, uh, talk about really bad online art services like Artstack, where people can basically make uh, image uh, uh, scrapbooks of, of art. Yeah. Uh, yes, and, um, and but, but anyway, the, she concluded with, there is no art online, we have to really make it. And th this was, I was like, no art online. I've been <laughs> writing about it for 20 years. How is there no art online? You know, this is really, this was really strange. And then in the debate afterwards, she said, well, my, my, uh, I, I, uh, my, I, my point of departure is art discourse. Now you can really debate about what art discourse, which art discourse she takes as her starting point, of course. But, um, I found it really interesting that apparently the stuff that I've been writing about is completely, it's not only worthless, it doesn't even exist in this woman's 
point of view. So this, th that I found really shocking to, to experience. Um, but uh, so uh, today I've been trying to uh, look up some stuff for you because you said bring me some art projects that are related. And uh, well, the first thing that uh, got to mind, of course, was the money. Yeah? The, the, the artist money is, is not a new thing. It's uh, been happening for a long time. Um, um, the most famous example I got from this one is the Boggs Bill, uh, an artist called uh, J.S.G. Boggs. I don't know what his first, what his initials stand for, but anyway, he made dollar bills where the the the, the, the number in the middle was replaced with the word fun, so not one but fun, and uh, this was used for actual ex exchanges. But this man ended up in jail, ended up as a forger in jail for making this money. So this, this is kind of strange. Uh, so this, this will not happen to you because you're not imitating the Euro bill. But um, anyway, I thought it was interesting. And then there's Heath Bunting who has been, uh, for uh, a few years ago, he was broke, I think. And uh, what he did is he offered um, a sort of Weidebon, uh, uh, how do you translate that, Weidebon? Coupons, coupons for art, vouchers for art. So I bought one, I have a, I have it framed on my wall, 30 euros worth of art that I, I bought from him. And uh, for me, that, that voucher is, is as valuable as, your, as a lot of uh, people think your coins are, probably. Yeah, they're, they're pieces of art. So, um, um, and then I was thinking of um, looking at artworks that were specifically dealing with really your topic, you know, the, 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 the agriculture and value. And then I found out that Nobotic Research, uh, you, which you probably know, uh, they have been making a lot of really interesting works lately. And the last one is called Secret Life of Algorithmic Plants. Mm -hmm. And um, this is, uh, well, it's an ongoing project. As they've just started it. And so far, it is mostly um, a visual work. So what they've done is they've... Uh, They've sort of mapped out the whole trajectory around the value of agricultural labor and uh, printed it out on a large sheet of plastic, which is used to cover a field. You know that uh, plastic is sometimes used to cover a field. And I'll, I'll just use one, read you one line from their, s uh, from their website. Uh, precarious human labor connects on the field symbiotically with al agricultural machinery in order to stimulate the plant towards an optimized exploit. So what I found interesting, um, it's maybe I, I'm not reading it in a very uh, enthusiastic or how do you say this, optimal way, but what they really say, what I found interesting is how they connect the exploitation of underpaid laborers with uh, the use of machinery somehow, and um, how our food depends on this connection. So uh, the underpaid laborer is part of the machine, basically. So this is something that I think we need to address as well. And um, as far as this work here is concerned, I am curious about how, because I, I honestly, I don't know enough about <coughs> Bitcoin. So I'm uh, curious how this, you know, what is behind the valorization of the Bitcoin and how you could, mm, yeah, how you are actually using it as a critical element here. Uh, I can sort of imagine that there is some labor involved there that uh, might be important to highlight as well. But I just don't know how it works. So that's 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 my problem with this with this work that I cannot s tell you enough about it. And then the last thing I want to say, the very first thing that actually came to mind was not the box bill. I'm l I was lying. Uh, the very first thing was the Walden project by Frederik van Eden. Somehow, you know, this commune from the 19th century of the Dutch writer uh, who uh, was trying to build a better world by living in, uh, building an agriculture or or a, a, a country community. Uh, and it failed because of uh, financial mismanagement, basically. They were probably just not good enough with money. That's, yeah, exactly. 
but uh, so I think that um, this project somehow fits in with a history of these kinds of projects and, and community projects and communes and artist communes. Thank you, Josephine and uh, Kurt. What I learned with this regard that is really dear to me, like the research on how humans are being substituted or better they are subsumed into machines, no? It's, uh, it's the metaphor of the mechanical Turk, which Amazon used even to name its product, the, the human that disappears into the machine. I think it's, it's important to focus on this if we followed your line. And what I learned from Debra, or also from Francian here in the public, from permaculture experts, is that uh, they are trying to avoid the machine, and they are demonstrating that by avoiding the machine, but by using uh, real intelligence in what you do, uh, so a real design, real knowledge, uh, it's possible to have yield, the, a yield that is, that is high quality, that maybe doesn't scale, but then if you have this knowledge spread, then we have less, less serves. You know, permaculture is this thing that comes after um, uh, the, the oil intensive uh, uh, framework. No, we have like first a labor intensive age, then with uh, the advent of machines, we have this oil intensive, uh, resource intensive uh, uh, relationship to, to the production from Earth, so that we have machines working the Earth. And permaculture uh, presents itself as this design intensive approach. I, I mean, whether or not you use the word permaculture or agroecology or whatever word you want to use, I mean, people uh, feed themselves, most, most people um, feed themselves without using these uh, intensive methods. A lot of uh, it's possible and it is scalable because um, in certain parts of the world, uh, places where a lot of the people work to feed the kind of food that we like to eat, feed us that kind of food. So they are the um, part of the mechanism, um, unwittingly and unwillingly. They uh, feed themselves with a different kind of agriculture. So I would never say that it, there wasn't uh, scale, uh, that permaculture doesn't scale, or um, uh, agriculture without machinery and uh, inputs, external inputs that are extreme beyond the kind of inputs that you can easily uh, get yourself in a city, for example, where there's a concentration of people, or um, I wouldn't agree with that. But uh, that's kind of veering off the thing, but I would uh, like to put that forth. <laughs> so unless there are uh, some pressing comments from the panelists. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was wondering, uh, um, where's the profit? <laughs> yeah, I mean, w w where's the value, the added value? Well, added, the added value, um, I understand differently than profit, but uh, okay, so added value. Uh, there's energy going into it, you have to set it up. Yes. Uh, you have to buy a computer, uh, you have to make a computer, and, and so there is investment. Well, Real Botanique as an artwork, it's, um, talking about entropy, in this case, heat. I mean, it's not, uh, I'm not, uh, we're not suggesting in this work that the best way to produce mycelium mat uh, mats to inoculate soils and turn um, large amounts of organic material in cities quickly into soil, I, I'm not suggesting um, that this is the best way to do it. It's just the best way to do it in this artwork. So, but I mean, but uh, I do, we do suggest that using entropy would be the best way to do it. So any kind of heat, the heat doesn't need to come from a, a computer mining Bitcoin, it could be from a server farm, it could be from a house, it could, there's lots of places where the right amount, of the right temperature exists in, uh, in the form of entropy. And it comes always from a technological, it comes always from the technosphere. And um, the, <coughs> the profit, the added value, comes um, in a soil which performs much better 
at what soils do. So soils, they are ideally living organisms that are very diverse and they are breathing, they are a lung, they are, um, um, uh, they're sequestering water and nutrients and they are not releasing these water and nutrients except to things, uh, to plants that we're gonna eat, hopefully, or beasts that we're gonna eat, hopefully. And um, so the prophet comes in a better functioning organism, which is the basis for our tiny little organism. That's what I would say. I also wanna say, um, in terms of tying value into uh, financial markets, I, I believe in Karl Manga's definition of value, which is that n value does not exist outside of human consciousness. It, 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 we assign value to things, but things exist. We have needs. We have needs for food and nourishment. You, you need that. Then you can also value a good meal, like above and beyond. Picasso, uh, if you go down to the south of France, there is a restaurant, I believe it's called Colom d'Or, and uh, there's all these, uh, these uh, Picassos on the wall. Picasso hung out there and decided he liked the guy's meal and thought it was worth giving maybe a painting he could sell for five million. He thought the meal was worth one of his paintings. He would doodle on the, the um, placemat and give it to the guy. He has M Matisse was down there too doing the same thing. All these guys were down there doing giving him art for his amazing food. A good restaurant over there. <laughs> Value also, like, look at uh, Banksy. There's a great documentary about Banksy, and he was in New York, and he gave all these, uh, some guy, you know, w obviously working for him in um, Union Square, selling some Banksy ripoffs, but they were actual Banksy's. And they, they followed this woman who, who bought four of them, negotiated the guy ferociously down. He was, it was a $60 price tag for two, and she's like, no, I'll take two for 30. And he's like, okay. He had to take whatever the person offered. And then she found out it was Banksy and they were each worth $60,000 because people knew it was then Banksy. But it, that's, obviously we assigned more value knowing it's Banksy, not on the, in, there's no intrinsic value to that specific piece of artwork until <laughs> it becomes signed by Banksy. So um, that's in terms of value, I think it's important to like define it in some way. But we assign so much value to things. So, for example, an insurance company, uh, well, no, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. Last week, we were having the Tempe workshop here, um, using Tempe as a sort of analogy for soil, uh, the function of fungi in soils. Um, some participants can tell you how that works. But uh, so, Francian said, um, the after having looked at the Real Botanique work, well, there is, uh, the value is the value. But we're, as you say, humans, assigning value right and left, and we have this complex system, which we're in, and a, a very uh, complex uh, stack, uh, castle of cards that we've built, where people say, this damage is worth this much, or this litigation is worth this much, or... And by the way, I might add, a lot of the financial catastrophe we see around us is essentially taking one simple contract, a piece of debt, and these banks chop them all up into little tiny pieces and spread them out. And the value was assigned by the rating agencies who said this is the equivalent of a Banksy. This is a, you know, a Picasso. These are works of art. These are grade A. On their own, they were toxic, but if you, magically say, ooh, Moody says AAA, and then it was supposed to be AAA, but the value, <laughs> the value is literally not there once it all uh, came tumbling down. So, so let's hope that uh, someone like Ron becomes the new Moody, because he has better taste at least <laughs> <laughs> in choosing artists. <laughs> These agencies, I mean, they are just amateurs, basically. I mean, th th they're, they're also assessing the value of countries. How, how do you assess the, the value of a country? I mean, th this is, this is. <coughs> yeah, but, but, but then again, the, the, um, the, the, the governments of those countries, they uh, adjust their entire policies 
on these adjustment on these these assessments. Based on, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, let's to mention uh, the, the, the e enormous uh, cuts in arts, as we are saying, like what developed the consciousness, what can be actually a reserve for, for uh, value, mm. is, uh, is uh, the sector that is most hit right now in Europe, especially in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in the last uh, two years, three years. Add one thing, just a quick thing about somebody in the audience, just Max Kaiser, uh, <laughs> relating to all of these uh, financial system and derivatives, because what you have with derivatives is the pricing of otherwise intangible risks and, and intangible assets. And um, uh, almost all the derivatives, uh, BlackRock and JP Morgan are the two biggest uh, CME group. If you look at their patents on their algorithms that assign uh, prices to these uh, derivatives, they all reference Max Kaiser's uh, patent, where he uh, developed he de developed an algorithm technology to in order to price the intangible um, fame and ethereal things like that. So, uh, uh, with Hollywood Stock Exchange. So, I think uh, there is somebody in the audience who knows how about pricing these. We were talking about the intangible sort of. It's not gold. It's not art. It's not that. It's something a, a thought or feeling or you know things like yeah. that. I can add that, that that is super interesting. I feel I find it also uh, uh, well kind of peculiar that we as humans we are the only animal able to consume symbols uh, because other animals they cannot they cannot do that I, I guess. And this is something beautiful. And I think if you look at art and the value of art, then it's kind of also a wonderful thing. I also find it a bit uneasy in the discussion that we are making this reference to art, that's fine, but we cannot stay there because there are more urgent matters beyond it. If we just stick to the discussion about the value of art, uh, and as an example, that's too frivolous, I think, because there is a real issue going on that right now, because we did not put the value on these biosphere entities, it also is very easy to destroy them because their value is not articulated. It's only this moral value or ethical value that, that we all agree on, you know, like the rainforest, that's priceless. But we don't put a price on it and then it becomes like so easy to destroy it. Um, and I think there we, uh, we have a job which is, um, yeah, it's urgent um, in this time. So we have to make this link again between being this one animal that can consume symbols. But yeah, if uh, at a certain moment, I think there's this old classic Indian saying uh, that once the last tree has been cut and the last river has been poisoned, then re you realize that you cannot eat money. And before we are at that moment, uh, we, we need to change the system. So I like to learn more from the, uh, the guest and also maybe people in the audience like what, what should we do? And what can we learn from art? But how can we translate this into our daily reality? So, yes. Thank you for the suggestion. Let's break the stage of this fairly formal uh, panel with questions. You have to get uh, closer because it's... Well, it's not actually a question, it's an observation, or as we're talking about definition of value, then perhaps we could, um, <coughs> I was once known as an artist, but I scrapped that because I prefer to be a creative person. So for me, it's about putting a value on creation. And that's what we do. We create our life, we create our environment. That's perhaps just an observation I'd like to throw into the equation because it gives it another twist. Thank you, Sam. Creation as the act of uh, inventing. I was wrong, there is a microphone here, so I invite uh, people that like to comment to just come here at the microphone in front of us. A quick comment on, on, the, on that, that that's exactly the purpose of our experiment, that we, um, we want to put value or test the value of our biggest asset and our biggest asset is our uh, possibility as mankind to create. So 
uh, and we symbolize it by art. I mean, it's, it's just a symbol of that creative power. Exactly. That's also my comment to your uh, uh, question. Um, <laughs> right. The mystery. Okay. okay, I just wanted to remark uh, also on core thing because I find it myself always a very difficult issue actually whether in one sense I understand that there is a need to, to put a pricing on the bioswear to make it sort of important and people put urgency to it. But on the other hand, I think, and I would like to ask you, this is not exactly the problem that we deal now with this capitalization and financialization of nature, in which, you know, in the end, even the, the air we breathe and the water we drink are all being put into dollar signs and entering this economic market, which I think the only way right now this would happen is by have being part of a capitalist system with all the rules that uh, entertain there. So I'm actually wondering whether this is really the way to go is to think about this equation <coughs> of the bias where as turning it into capital and prices. I, th I think the need will eventually create the value. Like with Bitcoin, that wasn't uh, created as some sort of experiment. There was actually a need in a globalized world on the internet to transfer value from you know, Amsterdam to you know, Lima. And one could do it instantly through this uh, the blockchain and the Bitcoin, th there was a need for it first. And then the value is now because it's answering a need. So once, uh, unfortunately, I think it will be only once, um, well, more s glaciers fall off of Antarctica and Greenland melts and, and uh, you know, heat waves are kill tens of thousands of people. It already did it once in 2003 in Europe, but that wasn't enough. But it'll be once there's a need to actually survive, then we'll try to come up with the probably the solutions and the value systems to uh, save ourselves. But um, I don't think you can kind of assign a value first and then hope that you know we'll answer our needs then. Well, I think you're all r you, you are all right <laughs> because this this is true what you mentioned. I also fully understand the uneasiness about putting a value on, on the biosphere, because that's really, it's uncanny. It's, it's also, it feels like uber capitalism. And I think we have to address that in a, in a very concise way. For instance, if you just say like, this forest has a value of so many dollars, uh, it's too static, I think, because then you can get this situation where a farmer in the rainforest says, okay, I need this money for my forest. You're basically holding the forest ransom to earn money, and I think that's too static. Uh, what you could do is put value on what you mentioned, creation. So people should, be, should only be able to earn, um, in my case, I would say echo coins for the value they add to the environment, but it has to be something active by a human being. And then it becomes more um, humane and I think also acceptable that you can basically just say, like, okay, this Deborah here, what she is doing with that soil project that is creating value to the environment, we give her echoes and then, yeah, you can do with it whatever you like. You can buy a, a piece of bread or uh, change it for dollars. Um, so I, I'm, I wonder if that helps in your uh, uncanny feeling around putting a value, I think not so much on things, but on activities, creative activities that people do to the benefit of the echo uh, sphere and the biosphere. I just saw a documentary on that at the ITFA, I think it's called Banking Nature or something like that. And that's, uh, I thought it was quite shocking to actually see what's happening within a lot of big companies who can actually, uh, as a compensation for um, all the uh, damage they're doing and uh, plant trees at the other side of the world, 
which they also then uh, make their advertisements and their marketing with. And of course, a lot of people don't know and they think they're doing something really well. And what they then, what you then find out is what they're planting are completely like uniform uh, uh, trees that they make is are going to make a lot of money with in a few years. They have planted a few hectares of things, but not in a way that actually is making any contribution to a real uh, healthy ecosystem. And which is something most people, people like Deborah will know, but maybe most people who are not so into it wouldn't even know then and think, okay, they're really doing something good. They can deserve the eco coins. They built hundreds of hectares. And I think this is already in a way a bit happening in, yes, and the problem in a very negative way. Yes, and why is it negative and why is it so problematic? I think because it's organized by technocrats and corporations and uh, there's, no, there's no human quality in it because there's also this mismatch that the, the, our nations, our political leaders, they think we need to do something, we need to do this carbon credit kind of thing, nature services, blah, 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 and they do it with companies, but it's not being explained to people uh, because it would be too difficult for us. That's kind of the assumption. Because we are all romantic about nature and we don't want to put a value on it. So then th you get this mismatch, uh, which I think is very problematic. Because it should, in the end, be celebrated that there are people who do good for the environment. So, And I think if we do that, then we can make steps. I have um, a comment on this. Having worked with uh, Bernard Littair, uh, one of the... Uh, uh, elders of monetary policy in Europe, I, I learned from, uh, from him uh, uh, one, one uh, thing that is called echo, uh, funny enough, although it's a pretty common uh, suffix, is um, the what they called echo also in a project in Brussels, in, uh, in Belgium, is a scheme in which the municipality emits a complementary currency the echo for people that work in uh, in nature in natural services so that do also voluntary work that actually benefits the environment and this uh, echo can be redeemed for a percentage of the taxes now this is a very much of a public sector uh, uh, posture but yet uh, having worked in in policy uh, monetary policy advisor uh, advisory, this, this was a very powerful, uh, it's taken as, ex as an extremist. Eh? If you go to, to the, the council uh, of, of a state uh, saying this, you are already an extremist. But it's a, I think it's a very feasible thing that you accept these sort of coins for a percentage of the taxes and then you can even create a market for them because a person that wants to, um, that has no work in the green can buy, can create like these coins can be exchanged, so you can buy off a person that has done this work, some of these coins, for a percentage of the taxes you have to pay. Now, this is a formulation that is fairly simple. If you know that money is, uh, is uh, basically consciousness, it's basically psychology, the psychology of money, I follow more the school of uh, O'Connor, but it's basically, it's it's our uh, our um, decisions are made also on a, on a basics of of money on the basics of taxes like taxes is are the way we collectively steer our desires and our plans as a city as a nation state uh, so that we know how people can really plan in the future and on which step and which sort of people so this is like the top down view no, this is no, this is uh, this is uh, implemented in uh, in some experiments, and it is a well settled uh, monetary policy scheme that is regarded yet in circles as pretty extreme, actually. Also, I, I want to also bring. There is a name involved in all of this: uh, nature, uh, financial markets, and Bitcoin, and that's Blythe Masters. Um, you may have heard of the Exxon Valdez disaster, which is back in the 80s. And, um, you know, uh, Exxon was fined some billions of dollars that they've never really paid yet. But a young uh, banker at the time, Blythe Masters, she was working at JP Morgan, and their client was Exxon. And for them, she invented a thing called the credit default swap. And the credit default swap, particularly in Europe, in the European financial crisis, which is now wiping apart uh, 
you know, the cultural fabric of many uh, countries across Europe, um, the credit default swap was very instrumental in um, wiping out nations like Greece, their economies. She's now working in Bitcoin, <laughs> by the way, this woman of life masters. <laughs> so um, the she ties apart, all of them. But when you assign a value to nature, when you say, oh, you know, bumblebees provide, uh, you know, two trillion dollars worth of, uh, 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 bees provide two billion trillion dollars worth of value to our agricultural systems and our economies and our needs and our desires and our values and our wants. As soon as you say that, some, you know, some sort of Monsanto corporation goes, uh, so we can make two trillion dollars. Uh-huh. So if, 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 we, if we can replace bees, then we can make two trillion dollars, they're saying. That's part of the problem of our hyper-financialized system. Please, Max. Hi, panel. So yeah, some, a couple of thoughts just to uh, peruse. Um, one, one phrase that I picked up interesting uh, over the past couple of years is this phrase called the economics of extinction, uh, talking about putting value to nature. So in Japan, the bluefin tuna is extremely rare. And as it becomes extinct, the value is increasing. And now you have a situation where fishermen are taking these bluefin tuna out of the ocean and freezing them, uh, waiting for the day when they become completely extinct. And the values are trading in the now hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. Uh, so it's um, this idea of putting a value to nature is well understood by a class of humans that are counting on not only nature being destroyed, but these huge you know, populations of animals becoming extinct. And this, this kind of mentality is also seen in the global banking system because now we have many economies in Europe and in Asia now introducing what are called negative interest rates. So the value of money itself has gone negative. Uh, not only is it worthless, but it's worth less than zero. So here you have a, a global economy that places no value on nature that's destroying the ecosystem and causing extinction by of, of, the, of, the, of the prime um, apex predator, humans, that in the mind of many would create m more wealth for them. And they, they're feeding that model with a currency that's um, being uh, accelerating the process. The only way you could accelerate the destruction of, of, of humans on Earth is if you gave money a negative value to the point where people wanted to spend it faster to accelerate the arson that's going on. So here you have capital, you have arsonists who are destroying the planet. And instead of trying to figure out ways to stop them, the global banking system has figured out a way to speed it up. And then you've got a class of individuals that are placing an enormous value on that based on the extinction. So and I think about the history of art. Art has been a bulwark against a certain insanity of humanity. And its role has been valued in this way. But I think it's, we've, we're in a post-art society. I don't think art makes a dent in human consciousness anymore. Uh, the, the we live in a, basically a, <laughs> a, on a pile of shit, essentially. You know, it's kitsch. There's the, any, any art, I mean, if a Medigliani can go for 170 million, you know, something's clearly wrong. Thank you. <laughs> well, I've been holding back for a while now. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, um, well, I think you, the, the last bit of his speech I can totally relate to, uh, except for the dent. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, ha I have to uh, confess something, which is that I, I, I've been having a... Uh, problem with your work from the very first moment. And I think I've al already expressed it, namely that the way you deal with value is way too literal in this work. And um, it's, 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 it's uncomfortable for me because of 
the, the way that everything is uh, put uh, this money value on nowadays and also the arts is suffering from this extreme pressure to put money to put uh, money value on everything and to you know the whole creative industries push that has happened in the past few years and this work fits perfectly in that and so that I find really difficult to deal with and uh, so my question for you is how do you dodge it how do you uh, you know uh, steer clear from this very easy uh, valorization of, 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 you know, this, our work is valuable because we use energy to make food. Mm -hmm. yeah? Well, the central, the central word for the whole work is the, the title of the research is entropical. It's, uh, it's entropy. No? It's the second law of thermodynamics. The fact that uh, nothing uh, disappears in nature. No, everything poetry transforms. Ah, let me, let me unfold it. So when Max uh, brings it up uh, uh, and says negative uh, interest is destroying money, the first question that comes to me in mind is like where that energy will go? Do they believe that the second law of thermodynamic doesn't apply even to that so that money can really like be burned and not even the smoke will come out? So where does the value goes is more than how to quantify it is, is the focus and where, where it comes from and where it goes. Now, I think that uh, from my perspective, this artwork is an attempt to bring together two different worlds, not only as a visually appealing uh, experiment, but also from a cultural point of view. The world of uh, Bitcoin which has been a culturally fermenting uh, context that has been uh, extremely bashed from all over uh, for being, uh, uh, you know, it has been bashed from all possible sides, basically. The, the classic economists, the postmodern economists, uh, people bashed it before understanding it, bashed it after understanding it. Now, I, I don't really think it's, it's so brilliant to burn so much electricity to find an, a digital asset, but I think that the cultural phenomenon there has been extremely interesting. How actually uh, a wealth of uh, young people, whether in body or mind, has been really appealed in creating a new framework to assess values. And the fact that the first Bitcoin, the first thing that Bitcoin ever bought online, the first thing that uh, someone ever bought online was a pair of socks, of handmade socks with alpaca wool. That's not a case. I'm so lucky that Deborah is a knitter and we wear like, you know, wool socks as a sign. And I think that was very symbolical. It's a symptom that this uh, community was not about uh, just uh, following the attribution of value of finance, but was about creating new ways to attribute value. And it demonstrated that it wanted to attribute it immediately to um, artisanal creation, to the capacity and to high value, because these socks are priceless. They are really good for your feet, you know, much better than anything you can buy. So basically, I think that uh, it's an exploration into that cultural world. And for me, it's like a short circuiting between that world and the world of art and the world of the cultural industries and the world of the academy, the world of people that are paid and ready to have always an answer before you actually even have the chance to tell the history of the movement that is sort of being created. So um, to finish, I think what I foresee is that out of this uh, um, crazy experience of the Bitcoin, it will come a new generation of uh, value, or a new platform for value assessment and perhaps also for artworks. And, um, and that's, that's most, most, uh, most that I come to think in, in mind. I'm not sure I answer, but maybe. few comments on that. Uh, first, uh, the first socks were, of the, the first uh, transaction with bitcoins may have been socks. But I think most uh, value 
uh, transmitted at this moment with bitcoins is criminal money. Not? Okay. But there is this danger of, uh, because it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's uncontrolled, which is, uh, uh, you can see as an, as an, as an um, enrichment of the, of the system. Uh, <laughs> okay. There is way more criminal activity flowing on uh, euros and... Well, we, w we cover this quite extensively. Um, uh, Wachovia Bank admitted to laundering 376 billion, 376 billion US dollars from the Mexican drug cartels. Uh, they admitted to that. And, um, you know, it was the investigation into them from the Department of Justice that they shut down their casas de cambios and uh, the UN actually said that it, it, they believe it triggered the financial crisis because it removed liquidity from the system. So they removed value from our financial system and it caused it to collapse. <laughs> but um, um, I, 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 for me, you know, I thought um, it really got me thinking, uh, Deborah's work about uh, our entire system for the past several hundred, for hundreds of years, I know we, we think all this capitalism and free trade is so new, but actually humans have been doing this for 5,000 years at least. Uh, you know, in China, uh, you know, you th three or 4,000 years ago, these guys were getting on boats wrapped up in, you know, thick, they wasn't even, there was no rope, there was no na nails or anything then. They just sailed off. 50% of them died. 50% of the ships never made it to, uh, y you know, the Middle East, Africa, and India where they were seeking to go. So, um, but the fact that Adam Smith, who uh, observed and articulated this, uh, this mimicking nature um, is an important ingredient to, um, the, um, to financial markets and free, cap free market capitalism. Um, so just to observe this whole process of creation and destruction and the creative, uh, the, the creative destruction part of your, <laughs> your studio is just like so remarkable. Um, and gruesome, but so uh, the, the most important part of the whole thing, that life, that, uh, that none of the beauty can emerge without that process, if you can't get rid of that ugly without the, the rest of it. So, and the fact that Bitcoin is tied into the end and absorbing the heat, is th that's the value creation, the, the actual um, money turning the whole system and keeping uh, part of the cycle. Respond to Josephine. Yeah. Uh, just that also these uh, mats, um, one of, well, for me, uh, there is poetry in the fact that these uh, cardboard mats, cardboard is an urban waste material. Uh, it's abundant. Most cardboard boxes, if you start looking around Amsterdam or the city, you'll see they're used once, they're perfectly clean, and they get thrown away. If you've ever tried to buy a cardboard box, you'll be presented with a quite different number anyway, but uh, this abundant waste material uh, becomes an inoculation for a soil in, uh, in our garden anyway, in the demonstration garden of Urbania Huva, we produce an extraordinary soil with uh, fungi and uh, urban waste materials like cardboard and also wood chips from the, uh, the municipal prunings. And these mats will be used uh, not so much for food production, but to, we're trying to change the um, nature of the fungi in our demonstration garden soil to be one that's also edible. But if you go into the garden now, that soil that we produced um, with fungi, with bacteria, working together with different kingdoms, uh, so not even just animals, just completely different kingdoms. It produced a soil which, according to Wacheninger, has this extreme value. We can't cash in on the value. The value is the value, but it uh, is this uh, extraordinary uh, material. Yeah. Yeah, but there is a question. So um, now you've explained the uh, the fungus element and how it feeds back into the food loop, more or less, <laughs> the ecosystem of that. But I don't understand how your Bitcoin mine feeds back to 
that ecosystem? I can tell you where I see the poetry. Speaking of this community, the minor that is exhibited there, it's an uh, uh, imperial monarch from Butterfly Labs. These guys were the first ones to come into a Bitcoin conference back in Prague and then in London, Max remembers them, to say, hey, we are going to build an ad hoc computer that is going to do this and it's going to do it faster, consuming less energy than anything else. These guys are really young, they were really proud, and they wanted to design a chip from ground up. Now, you know, I'm a programmer, I also get really like all uh, uh, wet eyes in front of good code. <laughs> These guys have talent and they challenged it and they developed an amazing machine to do that, like really optimized, really neat. And they faced two court cases. After, uh, after passing the FCC uh, uh, approval, they, they faced two court cases from the FTC, from the Federal Trade Commission. The first one they won. The second one is sending them bankrupt. While all over the world, there are people that tried and, and started to produce Bitcoin miners later, at a later stage, not being pioneers of the process, and they have no problem at all. This, these people had the, all the problems on their shoulders because they were the first visionaries to do this. Now, their company is probably closing. I wrote them about this exhibition. They were really, really happy to hear about it, and they say, uh, we are not sure we are surviving this wave. And I think, uh, I, I, I think uh, this for, for whoever followed the history of the Bitcoin community and how all the initial values got completely deleted by the machinery of corporations, of, uh, of state apparata, of all the big machinery that then uh, rounded up around, uh, this is the poetry, I think. It's like knowing who were the, the people that actually tried to produce something in that direction to make it more efficient and they really join the initial community and who was there know each other and today is really deceptive to understand the actual community but uh, but this is this is uh, i think it's it's a poetical uh, um, touch it's like the original apple like, like the original apple apple they, they macintosh sell yeah. for a million bucks now yeah it's so ridiculous yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's um uh, very optimistic note in, in your artwork that I see, and that's even more optimistic uh, uh, um, uh, in the uh, concept of next nature, and that is that we maybe should end uh, uh, a separation, uh, putting a, a stress on the separation between the technosphere and the uh, biosphere, because basically there is no technosphere or uh, biosphere as, as, as two separated en entities. And what we are discovering already from the dawn of human uh, of humankind is that uh, we use symbols, we use abstractions, we add values to things, but um, somehow we're starting to grow into this ever-evolving biosphere that we are also in need of. So um, we are. And that's my. There, basically, my optimism comes from there, is that we are learning as a species. Um, to uh, to integrate with uh, nature and w also with the concept of nature that we are building and we are part of. Um, what we should fight is our tendency to disconnect from it too, out of plain fear. Uh, but there, it, it, what you see is this is an ongoing experiment which is very interesting uh, with the mycelium and the soil. Mycelium is always. Uh, now trying also uh, to uh, live on the roots of trees. Trees are uh, bringing things back. There's information exchange, the same probably with Bitcoins. I'm not an expert on that, but anyhow, uh, we see that technology is moving also forward uh, to nature instead of only against. That is also an ancien regime fighting its last days. So this there is an optimistic, um, very beautiful image in your artwork too, and in your concept of next nature. Please. You know, I, I actually I just realized um, this is quite remarkable is that everybody here is speaking English and I think it's just because of me and Max here. Otherwise, you would have all been able to do this in Dutch. But uh, try, what's that? Italian. Uh, he Italian. could speak, he could speak, he could speak. No, there's he other Italians. Yeah. all start speaking Italian. Uh, well, try going to America and speak, holding a conference in Italian, or maybe in Little Italy, but uh, it's, uh, it's, I, I value that greatly. 
<laughs> Thank you, Stacy. <Stacey. laughs> yes, and then some more. I just wanted to add something to what that gentleman over there said. Um, I mostly agree with you, but I think that we need to step, take it a step further, which is that th we start to differentiate between um, what we need to do when we really take in that the technosphere is part of our biological sphere as well. So uh, I think it's too easy to say if we just take it in and see it as part of our nature, then everything will be fine. But of course, there's many different positions in how to do that. And of course, with the way the world is organized at the moment and the difference in wealth uh, distribution and all these things, I think that there's a lot still, you know, to be fought in that field. That's all I wanted to say. Can I, can I just, yeah, I'll just, uh, continue from where you left off. Oops. There's, there's a few comments been made, and uh, I follow Deborah's work very, very closely, <laughs> and I'm very inspired by her work, and thanks. <laughs> um, so my interpretation of this piece of art, your question, is also the fact that she's using mushrooms, which have spores, which have been known to communicate on many, on a very fine level, which is the same. This is the intangible. This is the tangible version of the intangible computer connections that exist these days, which are neurons put in a box. <coughs> California, or something. I think if I watch the right documentaries. So for me, it's it's um, our place. There, there's two things I, I I thought would be interesting to share as observations and connections. It's like, this is the connection I see in this particular piece of art as well. Um, and the value is, for me, th there's, it's an energy flow and communication seems to be the highest valuable thing in community, communication, community, togetherness. And you cannot put a value on that directly because knowledge, shared knowledge, cannot have a physical value because it's enriching people's lives or their value of life. The other thing is, before, beyond your spades, there was gifting. And what I call a fractal economy existed, which is before direct exchange. You have something, you have an abundance, which is what Deborah's creating with earth and worms and fertile soil and food. And then if, if I have plenty of worms, <laughs> then I'll gift them to somebody who doesn't have them. But it doesn't mean they have to give me something back. They might give somebody else something that they need at another time. So it's, it's a life value. It's, I don't know how to explain it properly. If I'm adding something to the equation here, I hope so. But it's, it's, it's like gifting and passing on and communicating is you, you cannot put a price on that. It, uh, I think what we're all trying to do is enrich the human life. You can say I'm doing it for nature. No, you're doing it for human existence. You're doing it for your own personal life ex experience and hopefully passing it on, as the tribals would say, to the next seven generations. Something like that. So thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Uh, I add two things to it. One, I think, is not a coincidence. The fact that uh, one of the first wallets uh, of uh, Bitcoin is called Mycelium and is a, a pretty valid one, one of the most reliable. And the second is that uh, I believe, now this is uh, history made with an if, that if Bitcoin wouldn't have been treated uh, as money, wouldn't have been used to create money and therefore as a unit of value and therefore plugged into the financial system, but used for other things for which the blockchain is being now very famous as being useful for, then probably the whole community would have uh, defended itself better. So what you say is true, that probably, I mean, at the very beginning, this worldwide sensation brought together a lot of uh, people that had in common uh, certain values and a lot of enthusiasm for making things known. Uh, new and 
the fact that then it ended up building a monetary system, it's probably what ruined them. So some of your remarks, what ruined us, yeah. It's, uh, some of your remarks might be true in saying, yeah, you don't need to give value to everything. And this is probably what, what is the dark side that is eating, eating Bitcoin from inside. Yet it will be still useful pretty much as an asset, I guess. But I, um, I was, you know, Max was mentioning that art, people don't appreciate art or they, it doesn't hit their consciousness. And I was reading about Constant, you know, from uh, Cobra, the Cobra movement. And his new Babylon was quite fascinating in terms of our discussion here in that uh, art would not be needed once we were in this post-money, post-work environment when robots and everything would be automated and we, we, we wouldn't need art. Uh, but this is an interesting in terms of what I was saying about needs and create the value. If we don't have any needs, everything is met for us and we just have <laughs> leisure time, as he's saying, that we wouldn't, uh, maybe we're in this... Uh, you know, as Max is saying, is you notice that we're getting to this point where uh, art doesn't hit the consciousness. It's just like literally tins of shit that are sold and kitsch sort of stuff. That um, maybe it's at that point. It's it's not a coincidence that also this automation and robots are taking over most of the jobs and algorithms. And we're at the point where we don't need to work <laughs> and create value. It's created for us. <laughs> A uh, couple of points. So, um, yeah, my comments were before were quite uh, you know negative, uh, but there is you know there is a corollary to that. There is a positive view of this, and um, I if you all recall our history, the uh, the, the, the British Empire in India w was taken down. Uh, people realized they could spin their own cloth and make their own salt, so the empire was essentially destroyed. Now the the, the current empire, the current enemy are a central banking system that is assigning value in ways that are accelerating eco-annihilation. But we have here, everyone in this room, the ability to create our own money at home. This is what Yaramel, this is what he talks about. There are 500 cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is the most well-known. Uh, there are many others. And you, you can create your own cryptocurrency in your home. And you can trade with each other in cryptocurrency completely outside of the current banking system and thus bankrupt the current banking system and put the empire out of business. I mean, here in the Netherlands, you're very adept at growing your own weed. Um, so just start growing your own currency. Um, so, uh, you know, th th this, this is the message. And this is well within the realm of, of possibility. The value is consistent. The, the cryptocurrency cannot be forged. That, that's what's beautiful about it. It's the only digital asset that's ever been created in the history of digitization that cannot be uh, forged in that way. It's a unique, it's a unique asset. That's the genius of this in invention, which some would say is similar to the printing press or uh, other epoch-defining inventions. And I would tend to agree with that if everyone embraced it. And to put the, the purge, the, the, the plague of central banking, out of business because this is this is the the common enemy. Well, yeah, <laughs> a, a few comments. First, uh, um, your, your your comment about the um, the art market being ridiculous. Uh, I completely agree with that. That's why we keep our project also very low profile because we don't want to get the attention of the art market. Uh, because when they find out that they can buy coins by Eric van Lieshout for just 100 euros, then the whole experiment fails because th they are all going to buy these, uh, these coins. So we want to test it with ordinary people. Um, th that's just one thing. Um, another thing that, that was raised before is the, um, the idea of um, that it's our future to um, integrate with nature again. And I completely object to that. Um, I think it's mankind's sacred mission to uh, conquer nature. <laughs> and uh, this, so this whole idea of the, this, the, the, the being opposed to the 
the financing uh, of the uh, of the ecosystem i think that's a ridiculous idea it's it should be final uh, finance financialized uh, because that's the only way that, that we can get nature into the realm of where real life is taking place and real life of, of, of our li real lives is taking place in our heads. It's, it's, this is where the economy is happening, it's in our heads. And one way of getting th things of the outside world into our heads is by placing a symbol on it, uh, uh, making it into a coin. That's exactly what your example is with the, the spade. So, um, financialization, financialization of uh, the ecology is essential for the survival of uh, the ecology, I think. The problem is, of course, how uh, we're going to do it because the, 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 that that is yeah, yeah that's what we're trying all the time, um, and the, 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 let, let me ex express it in a different way. We've tried for millenniums to coexist with nature, and um, it worked worked pretty well. We lived for about. 30 years, that was the average age. Um, after that, or even before that, uh, uh, we were probably sick all the time. We were, we were having toothache all the time. We were, we, were, we were just doing fine. It's only 400 years ago that we invented the system that, um, that really added value to our existence. That's the capitalist system. And uh, I'm 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 a great fan of the capitalist system and the the essential of the capitalist system system that it's a market based uh, evaluation of value. It should be it should happen in in the, in the market and I completely agree with what you said that at the moment many assets are not valued properly. Uh, the market is not is not working properly. I'm I'm not sure if it's really the central banks who are causing the problem. Um, but it's a problem that, that, that we just, that we, 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 will, we, will, we will sort it out. And one way is with the Bitcoin. I mean, it's challenging the system. Uh, it, it's challenge, uh, challenging uh, the means that we, we transport value, the, the, the money system. So. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> <I> <laughs> I'd rather um, end it with this uh, splendid provocation for our <laughs> debate. I saw some people itching about this, but I think it's a very good uh, point you make. We are in a place, uh, the Netherlands, in which if we wouldn't have uh, uh, conquered, or if you Dutch people wouldn't have conquered the land uh, with, uh, with means, then we wouldn't be able to live here because nature actually kills. Try to be out there for a, an hour and a half like we have been in here so far and see what happens. So basically, uh, I think even here has become a little bit uh, too cold. If we don't have a drink, drinks are there. There is a warm uh, uh, exhibition inside, which is, you know, uh, use that entropy because it's going on. And um, I thank you all the panelists for coming here. Really, you made all this exhibition special and you as an audience. Thank you for coming and enjoy the evening. <laughs>